Well, it's good to be with you all again, and thanks for having me. And if you were with us last time, what I was explaining is that I just want to walk us through the Bible, and so we'll do a little bit each time. And the idea is that every step will build on the previous step. And what happens sometimes um, in work on justice and mercy is that people will have uh, maybe a few favorite verses or uh, a couple of themes they like to go to. Um, but I want I want us to, to have a full scriptural uh, perspective. And I'm actually going to put justice and mercy inside a bigger box tonight. What I want to do is, is talk about tonight, uh, about being a blessing. So we talked about the opening chapters of Genesis, and I'm going to build toward that and, and weave what we learned uh, earlier into a bigger narrative and then and keep on going. And I want to put justice and mercy actually within this idea uh, of mission, because it's not justice and mercy are not static. Uh, they're actually part of a movement of the people of God. And not only a movement of the people of God, uh, of a demand of the people of God. So this idea of mission. And the way the Bible will describe it in Genesis, where it all kicks off, is uh, to be a blessing. So we're going to unpack that tonight. And justice and mercy become ways of achieving that. Um, but the idea is, is being a blessing to the world and, and seeing what that means. If you go to chapter 12 of Genesis... It says this in verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Now, if we just begin to understand what he is giving up, okay? he is giving up a country, a place that he knows, the places that he knows. Um, he's giving up his country, that is his people, and his father's household, which would be code, for his inheritance. So he's giving up not only uh, his place and his kin and um, the, the environment that he knows, he's also, also giving up family connections and the legacy that he would receive from his father. And what we're going to find out as we work through these passages tonight is that our mission is to be instruments or presents, you might call that as well, uh, of blessing. And the question we'll have to ask is, why is this the mission of the people of God? And what does being a blessing, blessing actually mean? So why? Well, last time when we were together, we talked about Genesis 1 and 2. And this was uh, the image of God discussion that we had. And what we talked about for those who uh, weren't with us or those who were with us but may have uh, forgotten or need a refresher is that oftentimes when we talk about the image of God, <clears throat> we're talking about human worth. The image is, has a function. Not only is it kind of inherent worth, not only are humans the culmination, the last piece of God's creation, everything had been good up to this point, but after he creates the humans, he says it is very good. So humans are the culmination of God's creation, but there is a functional aspect to our creation in the image of God, and that is to rule and subdue the earth. We are to rule in God's, uh, as God's instruments, and that would mean ruling, this is going to be important in just a moment, ruling as he would rule, because in Genesis 1, as he rules, what he does is he gives life, and everything is working as it should. This is a benevolent king, and so he invites humans now to continue his work. And the very fact that we are called to rule and subdue tells you that the work is not done. So he is inviting us to continue his work under his rule, even as he's given us this royal privilege. The temptation in chapter 3, if you go to verse 5 of chapter 3, I want you to look at what the serpent does in the buildup to that passage and then the temptation itself. Now, God had put them there, and he says, you can eat anything in this garden except for the, the fruit of this one tree. So it's total freedom with one restriction. But look what happens in verse 1 of uh, chapter 3. The servant was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say 
Now he begins to probe. How well does she actually know or believe what she's been told and the man as well to do? Has God actually said, you must not eat from any tree of the garden? Well, that flips what God had said. God had said you can eat from any tree but one. He says, did God really say you couldn't eat from any of these trees? So he's already putting into question what God had said, which is one of the things that Satan does. You begin to question the word of God. And the woman says in reply, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that's, the tree that's in the middle of the garden. Now watch what she says. And you must not touch it. God had not said that. Or you will die. Well, if you go into chapter 2, God had said, on the day you eat of this, you will surely die. Literally, dying, you will die. So she actually adds a restriction that wasn't there, and she softens uh, the penalty. It's not surely die, it's we will die. And now that the serpent recognizes that he's got her, he doesn't question God. In verse 4, he says, you will certainly, now he picks up the surely, you will surely not die, you see. So now he's directly contradicting what God had said. And then he questions the character of God. Even as he's denied the word of God, now he questions the character of God. For God knows that when you eat it, when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. That's a temptation of humanity, to be like God. Now, the irony of it all is that we are like God. We are made in his image. So the question is, how do we properly reflect the image? This is one way of doing it, where you... You challenge God, you question God, and you actually begin to take his place. Now, the question then becomes, what happens when humans rule apart from God? That's going to be the question, and we'll see it very quickly. Now, what is the fruit of sin? Well, we mentioned this last time. On the day you eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, you will surely die. And we talked about this last time, that in chapter 3, the odd thing is, is that nobody dies. Do they die spiritually? Well, Paul will tell us yes. But Genesis isn't, doesn't even think in those categories. What you have is separation from God. See, they're out of the garden. They can never go back. So in the Old Testament mindset, it's not kind of the Pauline concept. See? In the narrative is separation from God. Now, now, Paul will talk about that as spiritual death. But in the narrative, we've been separated from God and we can't go back. How does that get fixed? Okay. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, if you're following me in your Bibles, you get that odd idea that she gives birth to another son and she thanks God for that. What an odd turn of events, you see. On the day... You eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, in the middle of the garden, you will surely die. Well, all we're seeing now is life. Separation from God, but they're still alive. But then in chapter 4 is where we get the first death. Cain kills Abel. Death has come. And how does death come? Humans kill humans. That isn't even contemplated in the early chapters. But this becomes indicative of all humanity. We are violent creatures. And then in chapter five, we talked about this last time, the refrain that you hear over and over and over again is, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. And what we have here is death, not by killing, but death by old age and disease, probably. And then in chapter six, verse 11, very telling verse, the earth is full of violence. Of course it is. That's who we are. And so then God judges the earth and everybody dies. So we live in a world of death. This is what it likes, what it's like to be human. So the question that will begin to surface is, how does God respond to this? And what we have in these first few chapters of Genesis, now we're moving beyond what we saw last time. 
are some glimpses of hope. You get the occasional uh, person uh, who, who is exemplary. I mean, you get Seth at the end of chapter four. He's the next son that's born to Adam and Eve. And it says that at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. That's good. But then he disappears. Whatever happened, we don't know. Chapter five, Enoch walked with God. And he's taken away. He's gone. See? You have this kind of isolated cases. Whereas the mass of humanity is dying and killing each other, you have this occasional glimpse of hope. And the great hope is the person of Noah, who is the righteous man. And you can see the play if you go to chapter 5, verse 29. Look what it says. This is also a wordplay in Hebrew. He named him Noah, and he said, he will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord is cursed. This is the echo of the curse of chapter 3. Noah will set it all right. All of it will be taken away. He will be the great hope. And the story begins very well, actually. He obeys God. He builds the ark. His family goes in. All very good. He comes out of the ark. You see this in chapter 9. He comes out. God makes a covenant. And you actually have a repetition of the very words uh, of chapter 1. If you go to chapter 9, verse 1, look what it says. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, hear the echo of chapter 1. Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Chapter 1. It's beginning again with the great hope of the world. The difference is, not only do we rule, look in verse 2. Now the fear and dread, you see, things, the tone has changed. And then you go to verses 5 and 6, and it talks about the shedding of blood. And then in verse 6, whoever sheds human blood by humans, shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God, as God made humankind. Now, I want you to see what's happened. Killing is now assumed to be part of the human reality. That's just a given now. We live in a world of death. <laughs> and now, because of the fall, even after the judgment and the cleansing of the earth, this is the human reality. Now, what makes it so tragic is Noah, who is the great hope. The last thing we see with Noah is that he's lying in his tent, passed out, drunk. The great hope of the world, a failure. So when you come in the narrative to the end of chapter 9, the question now is, well, where do we go from here? Even the most saint-like human on the planet is a terrible failure and succumbs to his own uh, sin. And it gets worse. How's that for an <laughs> uplifting story? <laughs> but what it's doing, I want you to see what it's doing. It's setting the stage for the mission. You see, this is what's so important. There is no one person who is good enough and holy enough in a sustained fashion to save the world. Chapter 11, verse 1. The whole world had one language and a common speech. And as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And then they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city. Now, what I didn't point to, um, but in chapter four, uh, Caleb builds the first, uh, Cain uh, builds the first city. So the city concept is not necessarily a good one. So they, they, they build a city. That's what they want to do. With a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered 
over the whole, over the face of the earth. Now look at that. What did God commanded humans to do? To fill the earth. What is it that they refused to do? To fill the earth. Lest we be scattered. And then they're talking about building a city all together with a tower. This would be kind of a ziggurat. We, used to, we call them, they're kind of like this kind of uh, buildings that you find. And we still have some actually uh, in ancient Babylon, the ruins of these things. And these were step structures. And the idea was that these structures were like a stairway to heaven. And also that the God or goddess could come down, you see. So the, the idea would be communication with the heavens. Now, remember chapter three, the temptation to be like God. And here, the idea to be where God is, that's where we want to go. And we will have uh, this step structure so, so, you know, God can come down with us as well. So you see the aspiration of chapter three, verse five. Now, all of humanity doing this. And then the clincher uh, is verses five and six. You get a bit of divine humor. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that people were building. See, in their minds, this tower is reaching to the heavens. In God's eyes, it's so small, he's got to come down and kind of find this thing. I mean, so you have this kind of uh, mockery of the humans, right? They think they're building this wonderful structure. But in God's sight, it's, it's nothing. He's got to come down and kind of find it, which is also very true of humans. We, we, we're so arrogant. We think we're so great and, and big, uh, but actually we're, we're, we're very small. And this is what we see. But look at the next verse. Because, he says, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. The idea is this, that when humans come together for evil, there is nothing that can stop their evil. It knows no bounds. And so that's when he scatters them. See? Now, people will say, well, you know, this is actually a good thing because this is where cultures begin. I don't know if you've heard that kind of thing. Uh, true enough. Um, but there's another tale going on here, <laughs> see, a tale of, of global sin and a tale of, of judgment. And God will divide us to save us from ourselves. If you go to the book of Revelation, you have the final Babylon. One more time in Revelation, the nations come together in rebellion against God. And what you see throughout the breadth of scripture then is the history of the nations of the world in this world of death begins at Babel and it ends there. Babel is our mother and Babel is our destiny. This is the human story. Once you begin to appreciate all of this, the human arrogance, the human uh, hubris, uh, human violence, a world where everybody dies in one way or another. Now you begin to ask in this kind of world, what, what is God going to do? If you go back to the, the call of Abram, if you understand now, all the nations are born at Babel. You can appreciate that God cannot choose a nation. All the nations are born at Babel. What God does, he chooses a man and his family, and he will begin to create a nation. A different kind of people with a different starting point. Okay, That's crucial. They're to be different than everything else that's come before them. Um, I will make you into a great nation. 
Okay. Oh, I know where this comes from. If you were to go back to Genesis 1, verse 28, that's right, where he tells the, them to multiply, okay, now he is going to create and multiply a people. And one of the interesting things that you find when you go through the book of Genesis, how hard it is for this group of people to multiply. You have the issue of barrenness over and over again. Okay? So he will make them a great nation, but that in and of itself will be a pilgrimage of faith. Okay? Echo of chapter one, you find in verse two. Then he says, I will make your name great. Go back to chapter 11, verse 4. Let us make a name for ourselves. Chapter 12, I will make your name great. You hear the contrast. They will make their name great as in their arrogance they aspire to heaven. God will make his people's name great as they obey him. It's not about them at all. It's not about what they achieve for themselves. He will make their name great as they fulfill what he's called them to do and to be. You can see how it's, it's playing off of the previous chapter. Now, here's another thing that's very interesting. Depends on your version. If you go uh, to chapter uh, 12, verse 3, and all the peoples on earth. Now, it depends on your version. Okay, Mishpachot. It can be, depending on your version, they'll translate it as families or peoples or clans. Um, that word in Hebrew can have these various meanings. But the interesting thing is, this is the word from chapter 10, when it says, and these are the descendants of Shem, according to their families or peoples or clans, depending on your version. What he says in chapter 12, verse 3, through you, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. Chapter 10, these are the peoples that came from Shem. These are the peoples that came from Japheth. These are the peoples that came from him. All these peoples are born at Babel. What he's telling you in chapter 12 is the very peoples who curse God and rise up in rebellion against him in chapter 10 and 11, these are the very ones that we are called to bless. Isn't that fascinating? See? The very ones that are born at Babel, the sons of Noah and their descendants, those are the ones, which is all of humanity, that we are called to bless and to be a blessing. We are called to be a blessing to a world that's rejected God and that aspires to be like God. That is, that is who we are called to bless. Now, look at the structure of Genesis 12, one to three. In verses one and two, I will make you, I will bless you, I will make your name great, okay? What God does for us, he blesses us, and on the, on the basis of our being blessed, now we'd be a blessing, verse 3. Okay. We can only be a blessing as far as we have been blessed. We can only give away what we have received. And this is what you're seeing in chapter 12, um, uh, verse 3. I also want you to look very carefully at the wording in verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Now, this is very interesting here. Uh, again, just technical stuff. I will bless those and whoever. The expectation is as we receive the blessing and as we are blessing others, the expectation is that people will bless us. But there will be a few, whoever who will curse us. We should expect to be cursed. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. That's the expectation. Now, 
there actually is a, the English here doesn't catch it. Whoever curses you, it's a different word than I will curse. It's actually a different word in Hebrew. In Spanish, we have menospreciar. To, to take them is no worth, right? To take them is uh, to belittle them. That's the word. Whoever belittles you or dismisses you, I will curse. And oftentimes, that ha that's how the opposition is, isn't it? They just dismiss us. See, we're nothing. See, we're ridiculed. Whoever does that, God will curse them. See? So this is what we're called to be. To be a blessing to a world that has rejected God. And we will receive a blessing. And because we have received, we now bless this world. This world of death. In this world of, of darkness and rejection of God. That's what we're called to be. Now, I want you to notice something. And this is why I'm saying this actually puts justice and mercy into the box. Because the just and mercy become, justice and mercy become the how. This is the why. This is the what. This is the mission of the people of God. We do not exist for ourselves. The reason for our existence is the world. And that explains the cross, doesn't it? Okay. So we are called to mission. And that mission is to be a blessing. And justice and mercy will be a part of all of that. But it's actually a part of a bigger picture. See, of a blessing. This is why we exist. And what you find is that blessing is spiritual. You know, if you go to chapter 12, uh, sorry, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, God sets aside the Sabbath and he blesses it. Today we set aside to be with God. And of course, the Old Testament will build on this. And we can talk about that later. But what you see excuse me, is that being, uh, experiencing blessing, part of it is, is relationship with God, okay? And, and what you see throughout um, the book of Genesis is that the, the patriarchs are building altars all the time. They're calling on the name of God. They're actually confessing his name, all these kind of things. So, so what you're seeing is this relationship with God. But it's also fascinating to see that people are, are recognizing this. They actually see the hand of God and they will say it. So here's a few. Abimelech, we don't have time to look at that one, but look at that one. Um, and you can see Laban and, uh, and Pharaoh as well, because they say this, we see that you were blessed by Yahweh or the Lord. They see it and they, and they say it. The interesting thing is, if you go to chapter 14, of Genesis. This is uh, where Abram rescues Lot. And he, he you know, the, the incident with Melchizedek. Now go to verse 18 of chapter 14 and watch very carefully. Again, words matter. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed Abram. Boom, there it is. Chapter 12. Okay? He blesses Abram saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So now Abram is blessing him. See, there it is, that transaction of blessing that we saw in chapter 12. Now, go to verse 22. But Abram said to the king of Sodom with raised, raised hand, I have sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. Now look at that. He repeats what Melchizedek had said, God of heaven and, and maker of heaven and earth. But the thing that Melchizedek does not know is the name of the God, Yahweh. 
So Abram says, I have sworn an oath by Yahweh, the name of his God, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. The same words that Melchizedek had used. Abram identifies that God as Yahweh. Okay, So they're seeing the hand of God through the people of God. But it's also about material things. You see, in verse 22 and 28 of chapter 1, he blesses them. And the blessing is concerned about giving life, of having children. And, and it's not only humans. In verse 22, it's about animals. See, It's life. And as you go through the book of Genesis, it's flocks, you know, Jacob and Laban. It's water. This would be Abimelech and Isaac. You see, where he finds water where no one else can. It's Joseph sparing uh, Egypt from famine. It's very material things. And this is why in the biblical mindset, you cannot separate spiritual things from physical things. This is what we have done, you see, in our theologies. But biblically, they've always been together because they all are grounded in the person of God himself. And what God has joined together, let no man you know, uh, to render us under, you see. So in the book of Genesis, to be a blessing to the world is to bless people by giving them the name of God. We do this in the name of God. And you see this over and over with the patriarchs. And we bless them physically too. Okay. So all the things that you guys do physically, that's part of the mission. You don't need to defend it. <laughs> It's just what God has called us to do. And we do it all in the name, now in our time, in the name of Jesus. And lastly, I'll close with this. Um, but you know, the book of Genesis is, is, is a good and a bad story. Because uh, the patriarchs will lie. Um, I mean, the most... Uh, insane thing is that when when dinah is is raped her brothers seek revenge revenge on the men of shechem and how do they do that by having them circumcised which is the very sign of the covenant and they are so incapacitated that gives them the chance to kill them i mean it, it's a total perversion <laughs> So what you have in the book of Genesis then are the high points and the low points. The people of God fulfilling their mission, chapter 15, verse 6, he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Um, if you go to chapter 22, this, is, this would be Isaac, right? Um, testing. And, and uh, if you go to, um, I think it's verse... Yes, go to verse 17 of chapter 22 and listen to the language. Let's begin in verse uh, 16, uh, 15. The angel of the Lord called Abram from heaven a second time. He said, I swear of myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, this is the thing of the narrative, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, filling the earth, that echo. And as the sand on the seashore, your descendants will take possession of the cities of your, their enemies. And through your offspring, all the nations on earth will be blessed. There it is. There's chapter 12, verse 3. But look at the clincher. Because you have obeyed me. There it is. It's a pilgrimage of faith and obedience. And as we do that... We fulfill our mission to be a blessing to the world.